If you're a grown-up, odds are you've been to school. And maybe even taken a science class or two. Which means you've probably seen one of these. It's called a periodic table of the elements. It's likely that your teacher spent weeks teaching you about it. But being a kid in school, maybe you missed it. Now that you're older, maybe you'd like to know more about the periodic table. Because maybe you're thinking about being a chemist. Or a game show contestant. Or a teacher. Whatever your reasons, we are here to help. This is the Periodic Table of the Elements, Part 1, The Making of the Table, from the CSET set of the Learning to Teach project. At first glance, the periodic table looks like any other poster you'd see in a science class. But it's much more than just a poster. It displays a lot of information in a really compact and efficient way about how chemicals work. Which is another way of saying it displays in a really compact and efficient way a lot of information about how the world works. So rather than memorizing every little thing about all the elements, scientists can just look at the table. But to understand it, it helps to understand some history. So let's start at the beginning, with atoms. Atoms are made of three basic parts, electrons, out here, and protons and neutrons, in the nucleus. All atoms of the same type have the same number of protons. For example, if there's one proton in the nucleus, it's a hydrogen atom. If there's eight, it's an oxygen atom. The number of electrons can change, or the number of neutrons, without changing the kind of atom it is. But the number of protons, if that changes, it's another kind of atom. Eight protons, it's an oxygen atom. Two, helium. One, hydrogen. These are also known as atomic elements. Atomic elements are pure chemical substances that can't be split or changed into other substances by chemical reactions. Some elements, like helium and neon, are very stable in pure form. In fact, helium and neon don't react with anything. They are completely inert. But most elements combine to make other stuff. How do you tell which elements are inert and which will react and with what? After all, there are more than a hundred of them. A hundred and fifty years ago, cleaning up this mess was the central problem in chemistry. In 1869, enter a Russian guy, Dmitry Mendeleev, to organize the mess. First, he arranged the known elements according to their atomic mass. Mendeleev put light ones like hydrogen and helium on one end, and heavy ones like gold, mercury, and lead on the other. Then, he did something very clever. He rearranged the long line into a table according to chemical properties like this. Hydrogen first, because it's the lightest. Then helium. Lithium is next, but it has similar chemical properties to hydrogen. So Mendeleev put it here, underneath hydrogen. Next heaviest is beryllium, but it's not at all similar to helium. So Mendeleev pushed helium down the line. Next heaviest is boron, then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Neon, it happens, is a lot like helium chemically. Neither react with anything. So neon underneath helium. Next is sodium. It could go here, but it just so happens that chemically it's a lot like lithium. So Mendeleev put it here. And magnesium is a lot like beryllium, so it can go here. Same with aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. So, increasing atomic mass as you go, with elements in any one column having similar chemical properties. 
Potassium starts a new row underneath sodium, because chemically, potassium is a lot like sodium, and calcium is similar to magnesium. Scandium is next, but chemically, it behaves differently than aluminum and boron, which means it can't be in the same column. So once again, we push these over to make room. Next is titanium, again, not like aluminum or boron. And then vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. But gallium is similar to boron and aluminum, so it can go underneath. When Mendeleev made his table, this element hadn't been discovered yet. So Mendeleev actually left a space for an as-yet undiscovered element he predicted would have a mass heavier than gallium and with chemistry similar to silicon. It was discovered two decades later. Scientists named it germanium. Next comes arsenic, selenium, bromine, and krypton, which is inert, like argon. With rubidium, it's back over here because it has chemical properties similar to potassium. Then strontium beneath calcium, yttrium like scandium, and so on, all the way across to xenon. Then it's back over here for cesium, like rubidium, then barium, then lanthanum. With cerium, another shift happens. It's not like titanium or zirconium, so it can't go in the same column. So all these get pushed along until you get to hafnium, which is like titanium and zirconium so it can go underneath them. Then the pattern holes all the way to radon, then back across to the other side, and all the way back to the very last known element, ununoctium, number 118. By the way, see that? Another empty spot where 117 goes. It's empty because it hasn't been discovered yet, but when it is, scientists fully expect that chemically it will be heavier than 116 and chemically similar to astatine and iodine. So this is the periodic table of the elements, so-called, because, well, it's a table, and because it shows the periodic pattern of chemical properties. The modern one is arranged not based on atomic mass, but on atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. And usually, you see it like this, because the wide version won't fit on a regular piece of paper. That's it. That's the backstory. As you can see, it's way more than just a poster. Next in the CSET series, how the table works and how to use it.